without further ado, so Ovriki is the endearing name for our beautiful Edinburgh city. And it was first used by the Robert Ferguson in his poem on Edinburgh entitled Ulriki. Translation, because I can't pronounce it, Ulriki, the best of every town that Scotland knows beneath the moon. Ulriki is an old Scots word for old smoky, so called because of all the smog and smoke that fill the streets of the old town in those days. And also, it also reflects the reeking nor loch into which poured all the waste and effluent from the good folks of Old Town above, with a few dead bodies thrown in for good measure. <laughs> so uh, let's fast forward to the present time, to the era of New Riki, the well smelliest flower, uh, Amorphophallus titanum, or corpse flower, at the Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh, which flowered for the first time in the summer of 2015. The air in Edinburgh certainly looks cleaner now, but is it? So has the air quality improved? And how has it improved? So let's explore together. The focus of the talk is on three key air pollutants, sulfur dioxide and acidic corrosive gas, mainly produced from combustion, ammonia and alkaline gas, mainly from agriculture, and nitrogen oxides, which is the collective term for nitric oxide, NO, nitrogen dioxide, NO2, a group of gases that are emitted when fossil fuels are burnt, and mainly from transport. These gases can react together in the atmosphere to form particulate ammonium sulfate and ammonium nitrate that are in the fine particulate matter. Together, these have wide-ranging environmental effects from harming human health to causing uh, damage to vegetation, leading to biodiversity loss, and they're also implicated in climate change. So the air pollution as we know it today stemmed from the Industrial Revolution. It was a period of substantial social and economic change. There was mass urbanization, and with a move from a rural, agricultural-based land kind of lifestyle towards a more kind of urban and factory-driven one. It also marked the start on the intensive use of fossil fuel, and in particular, a reliance on coal. All the progress came at a cost, however, so environmental costs. When, smoke, when coal is burnt, it releases smoke which contains sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and very fine carbon car particles. And when this smoke combines with fog or humid air, it forms smog. Smog is harmful to human health, it can cause asthma and even death. During the Industrial Revolution period, smoke poured from every chimney, from homes, from factories, from incinerators. But it was something that people just had to live with in the name of progress. That is until the 1952 Great Smog of London happened. So over a period of four days in December 1952, a dense yellow smog blanketed the city of London. Everyone ground to a halt. Economic loss was huge. And 4,000 people, over 4,000 people, died from the effects of the smog. And this forced the parliament to act. So the UK Clean Air Act in 1956 was born following the uh, disaster of the smog. It introduced smoke control areas for the first time, so reducing um, coal use to smokeless fuel, and it uh, introduced measures to reduce um, coal burning in urban areas, and it also gave local authorities the power to control emissions of smoke, grit, dust, and fumes from industrial premises and furnaces. 
the later act in 1968 introduced tall chimneys with the aim to disperse the pollution further. But um, the act of having taller chimneys reduces local pollution and just spread the problem further. So you just covered a wider area in the pollution. So all the Clean Air Acts and subsequent legislations were repealed and replaced by the Clean Air Act in 1993, which still remains in force today. Well into the 1960s, scenes like this were still commonplace, smog-filled streets and suit-covered tenements in Edinburgh and Glasgow, because change doesn't happen overnight. So the transition to cleaner fuel, the smoke control areas took years to take place. Uh, so for example, this news article in the archive reports that three months of dense fog affecting the Clyde area of Glasgow with economic cost to the tune of 20 million pounds. Burning coal also produced another problem, acid rain. So when the sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides are released from coal burning, it can combine with water droplets in the air to form weak solutions of sulfuric acid and nitric acid. And when this fall in rain, it creates what is called acid rain because the rain is more acidic. And it was um, a Scottish comic, uh, chemist, comic chemist, Robert Angus Smith, <laughs> who first came up with the term acid rain when he observed that rainwater near industrial installations more, were more, more acidic. And he published his findings between air pollution and acid rain in a landmark book, Air and Rain, The Beginning of a Chemical Climatology. He also observed the corrosion effect of acid rain. And he wrote in 1856, it has often been observed that the stones and bricks of buildings, especially under projecting parts, crumble more readily in large towns where coal is burnt. I was led to attribute this effect to the slow but constant action of acid rain. Today, the UK government sets out in its UK air quality strategy, air quality objectives and policy options to protect human health and protect the natural environment for today and into the future. In the UK, air quality is a devolved matter. So separately, the Scottish Government has published its Cleaner Air for Scotland 2 towards a better place for everyone. And it sets out the Scottish Government's air quality policy framework for the next five years and actions to deliver cleaner air for all. So some kind of background to air pollution. So when air pollutants are released, they disperse, carried by the wind, and become diluted as they mix with the air. Some of it will return to the ground through dry deposition or they will react to form particulate ammonium, sulfate, and nitrate. The ammonium sulfates, they have much longer lifetime in atmosphere, and they can be travel long distances and pollute other countries. These are removed either by dry deposition processes or by wet deposition in rain, in fog, or mist or snow. <coughs> so in the UK, the emissions from the, of the gases from different sources are compiled in an emissions inventory. The concentrations of the gases and aerosols in the air are measured in monitoring network. Wet deposition can be measured in rain. And dry deposition, it can be measured, but it's expensive and very complicated. So often it's just modeled. Under the EU National Emissions Ceilings Directive, now transcribed into the UK National Emissions Ceilings Regulations 2018, the UK government is committed to deliver emission reductions in five key air pollutants. 
And these are ammonia, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxides. That is the focus of this talk. And two other pollutants, non-methane, volatile organic compounds, and primary PM2.5. That's a fine particulate matter. And the objective is to reduce the levels and deposition of acidifying and eutrophying and ozone pollution below the critical levels and critical loads, which we'll come to in later slides. The emissions data that are compiled are available from the National Atmospheric Emissions Inventory, which also provides comprehensive emission about the air pollutants and their sources. So let's look at some data on where all the pollutants come from. These plots show the total emissions for each of the gases and broken down by the major sources. So sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide are released when coal and other fossil fuels are released. So the energy industries, power plants, and industrial combustion are major sources for SO2 and NOx. And these have come down substantially since 1990. With nitrogen oxide, because it comes mainly from transport, emissions of NOx from transport adds further to the total amount of NOx. And uh, an important point here is um, the year 2005, because that is the baseline year against which all the emission reduction targets are set. And it's important to know at that moment in time what sources are causing the pollution to target the mitigation and abatement. For ammonia, uh, a large proportion of it comes from agriculture and uh, is mainly from livestock farming and from the use of fertilizers. So currently about 87% of the total emissions in the UK come from agriculture. The map shows the spatial distribution of the three different gases. And each of the map reflects the kind of um, where the emissions come from and the source strength. So if we look at the sulfur dioxide map on the left, then the cleanest areas are the dark blue and then going through yellow with the highest emission areas. So Scotland is pretty clean, so the highlands and the west coast, because there's not much industry and not many urban centres. And you can pick out kind of Edinburgh, Glasgow, the central belt with the high emissions from industries. For NOx, because it comes primarily from transport, the map reflects centres of uh, population so the big cities like London, Edinburgh, Glasgow, and the major rail, uh, road networks. So for example, in Scotland, you can just pick out the A9, because that's where all the emissions are coming from. <laughs> and for ammonia, it's from agriculture. So the areas of highest emissions are areas with the highest intensive agriculture. So um, most of Northern Ireland, and um, in the border areas between Wales and Shropshire, in the Eden Valley, and in East Anglia. So very different patterns. Just a bit about ammonia. Following the war, the Agricultural Act of 1947 was introduced to promote self-sufficiency in food and to maximize agricultural productivity. And uh, since the Act was passed, then uh, the average cereal yield in Britain has been increasing year on year, as shown in the map. But the increasing efficiency in arable farming came at a cost to biodiversity, as the uh, plot on the right shows. So this shows uh, a change in vegetation communities on countryside survey arable plots between 1978 and 1980. And what it shows is that um, the plots with non-crop or weedy species are decreasing with increasingly intensive management of the land. 
The intensive agriculture would not have been possible without the invention of the harbour process in 1913. So this is the major industrial process for synthesis of ammonia by reacting nitrogen and hydrogen together under high temperature and pressure. And today, 50% and today, of the world's ammonia comes from this process. And about 85% of this ammonia is used to make fertilizers. The rest is used to make um, industrial products such as explosives. And uh, what might come as a surprise is that uh, ammonia also comes out of car exhaust because there are three-way catalytic converters that are designed to remove NOx also releases ammonia. And uh, it also talks about using as a fuel the future. So this is the same plot looking at total emissions in the UK for the three gases together with the emission reduction targets. For sulfur dioxide, there's been a substantial dec decline in emissions since the 1970. And uh, it's, on tar it's met the 2010-2019 targets and uh, there are further reductions committed for the years 2020, 2029 and beyond 2030 with 20, 2005 as a baseline. For NOx, the emissions are not coming down as quickly and um, transport emission is a problem and, um, and measures need to be taken to uh, meet those targets for 2029 and 2030. So, so some key events for the um, decrease in emissions in NOx and so dark side. So in the late 70s, there was a switch from heavy industry, notably in the iron and steel sector, to surface-based industry, which reduced combustion emissions. And the increase in road traffic led to more emissions of NOx in the late 70s. So, and then from the 1990s, there's a switch from high sulfur fuels like coal and fuel oil to natural gas, which um, helped to bring the emissions down. And then in 1992 onwards, the introduction of three-way catalysts in petrol cars and diesel vehicles helped to bring the NOx levels down further. But increase in traffic uh, is kind of offsetting some of that gain. For ammonia, ammonia hasn't really come down very much and data for ammonia is only available from 1980, but it's come down fair little since then. And with the current trend in ammonia emissions, then it's likely that uh, the UK will miss the target for 2029 and beyond 2030, and uh, actions will be taken to reduce emissions from farming. So again, uh, the same plot but um, with a breakdown according to the four UK nations. And this shows that um, England has the lion's share in the total emissions. And uh, so with nitrogen oxides, the decrease is 79%. For sulfur dioxide, it has been the most successful with a 96% decrease. Ammonia still remains a challenge. And if we extract the data for Scotland and plot that, it's very clear that uh, ammonia is uh, a lot more work need to bring the ammonia down. And with the NOx, then uh, the challenge of transport and congestion. So the National Survey, the F UK's first air monitoring network was started in 1961 following the uh, Clean Air Act and the Great London Smog. And it uh, monitored black smoke and sulfur dioxide. At the beginning, there were over a thousand sites. So as air quality improved, the number of sites was reduced in 2001 to just over 100, and then it stopped completely in 2005. But um, so over time, the 
national survey was replaced by other monitoring networks and other monitoring networks were added to monitor the air concentrations and deposition of different pollutants in the UK. And um, the DEFRA UK Air website provides comprehensive information on the pollutants and also on all the monitoring data from across the UK. So let's have a look at sulfur dioxide in two cities in Scotland. So Edinburgh and Glasgow. And this runs from 1962 through to uh, the current time. So the record in Edinburgh, so you see that um, the scale is, is different. Glasgow starts at 240, goes up to 240, and Edinburgh starts at 140. So um, the sulfur dioxide concentrations have come down hugely from uh, just under 140 in Edinburgh to about one microgram uh, in St. Leonard's. And uh, whereas uh, for Glasgow, that's uh, come down from about just under 240 to about three micrograms in 2013. So um, the it's silver dark side, it's improving and it's consistent with the reduction in silver dioxide emissions. Underneath, I've put down the air quality limits for silver dark side. For human health, it's 125 micrograms, but that's a 24-hour mean. But our data is on annual mean concentrations, so we can't complete, uh, com directly compare. But if we, we can compare with the uh, limits set for vegetation and ecosystem, which is set at 30, then we're definitely well below that level for protection of ecosystem and vegetation. Moving next on to the story of Knox. Again, this is uh, for Edinburgh and Glasgow. And um, so monitoring work started about 1980. And these are data I managed to pull out of their website. So it started very high for both cities, higher in Glasgow. And uh, importantly, what we see is that uh, Nicholson Street in Edinburgh, this is a site that is right next to the road and it's a very busy road, and the concentration started very high, and it's still very high. It's 44, and it's above the uh, air quality limits for protecting human health. So that's still an issue. And St. Leonard's here, it's a background site, so it's on a quieter road, and it's well set back from the road, and the concentrations are much smaller at 17. So that highlights the problem of busy roads and the proximity of where you are to the road. In Glasgow, it's a very similar story. The curbside site that's uh, right next to the road, busy, and um, the concentrations are even higher there. It's about 84. And um, there's two other sites there, which is background site, but they're still pretty high at 33, which is above the level for protecting vegetation ecosystem. So. We're getting a large reduction in sulfur dioxide, but NOx is still a challenge. So if we look at the background concentration map for NOx, then we can pick out areas like Edinburgh, Glasgow, Dundee, and Aberdeen, the kind of urban centers with high transport kind of car use. And then London is very high. So, but bear in mind that this is a background concentration map. So next to roads, the concentrations will be higher. So for urban flora project, depending on the proximate, how close you are to a road, it will affect your vegetation. And uh, on the right is just saying that um, there were just under 3 million cars registered in Scotland in 2018. So uh, transport is a problem. So with increasing car use and congestion, and uh, even with um, the introduction of stricter standards, it uh, is still a challenge. And uh, another problem with uh, NOx emissions, apart from the direct impact to human health, is also the formation of photochemical smog. So in the old days, smog from sulfur dioxide, but in these days, 
The smog that you see isn't usually photochemical smog. And uh, it's formed when uh, nitrogen oxide and volatile organic compounds in the atmosphere react with sunlight to form the brown photochemical smog. That lovely kind of orangey brown tinge you see on the horizon on a lovely still day. So, and um, so ammonia is quite complex. So we have a number of sites across Scotland which has been measuring ammonia since 1997. And I've picked just some summarize the data in this box plot of all available data from Scotland. So some explanation. The diamonds show the, these are annual mean concentrations and the timeline. So the diamonds are the mean concentration of all sites in each year. And there's no clear trends and it just going up and down each year, but are mainly below one microgram. The gray boxes, show the interquartile, the median and interquartile range, and the whiskers show the maximum and minimum concentrations measured from all sites. So uh, what we can see is that uh, since measuring, measurement began in 98, the maximum concentrations have come down, but that maximum concentration was actually driven by one site at Ochenkruf, and this was the, uh, Scottish Agricultural College, it closed in 2014. <laughs> so uh, sometimes you have to be very careful when you interpret this data. And um, so, but uh, from that chart, we can see that um, there are still number of sites with concentrations below the one and three micrograms, and the significance of which I will explain in the next slide. And it's on the critical levels of ammonia concentrations. And this is defined as the concentration of ammonia in the atmosphere, above which adverse effects on receptors, such as plants and ecosystems, may, may occur according to present knowledge. So um, long-term annual mean concentrations of one microgram per cubic meter is set for the protection of lichens and bryophytes. For other vegetation, it's three. And uh, a monthly mean concentration is also set at 23 micrograms. So every year, the critical level exceedance of ammonia concentrations in the UK are reported. And this is the latest map showing um, concentrations across the UK. The blue areas are the clean sites with concentrations less than one, and the red areas are above three, and the yellow areas are areas that are between one and three. So most of Scotland is very clean, but there are still large areas which are exceeding the one microgram per cubic meter level for uh, protecting lichens and bryophytes. And it's hard, oops, but it's hard to see. There are some red areas. But bear in mind, again, this is a background concentration map. So at farms and closer sources, the concentrations will be higher. So for example, if you go quite close to toilets in the town. <laughs> so just going to touch a little bit on the uh, ecosystem impacts of pollutants, acidification. Simple definition is when the water or soil becomes too acidic. Sulfur dioxide knocks on ammonia and their reaction products, ammonium sulfate and ammonium nitrate, when they deposit to um, the ground, causes acidification. So acid rain is uh, around 4.2 to 4.4, and clean rain is around 5.5. Five point five, sorry. <laughs> and um, so, when these uh, pollutants deposit the environment, it can uh, cause the soil or water to become acidic, and this has a number of effects. 
So uh, for human health, it's not really the acid rain that causes the problem. It's the ammonium sulfate and ammonium nitrate that are in the fine particulate matter fa uh, fraction that causes human health impacts. The acidification effects is damage to forest and other vegetation by acidifying the soil that would lead to nutrient leaching, so loss of base cations such as calcium and potassium, and the appearance of aluminium, which is toxic to plants. It can also damage aquatic ecosystem and by making the surface water too acidic, uh, leaching of aluminium, which is toxic to animals, and it also causes corrosion that we touched on earlier. So reacting with calcium carbonate and corroding metals and all of the associated problem. So on the right is a report in 1987 looking at uh, deformities in trout. So uh, kind of deformities uh, in the tail caused by the acid pollution and also a decline in the population. So in the UK, we have um, the precipitation network that has been collecting rain and analyzing the rain since 1980s. I've put out some example data from some of the sites in Scotland. And uh, so these are the six sites <coughs> across Scotland and uh, with a pH measured in rainwater from 1984 through to 2020. And what we can see is that um, there's a steady improvement in the rain and it's um, becoming less acid with time. So from the acid rain of about 4.6 and um, recovering to above five. But uh, a curious thing is happening because since 2020, the improving trend is flipped and the water is actually becoming more acid. So uh, this needs to be looked into a bit further to understand what's happening. It could be that we're importing more waste from more pollution from other countries, depending on the uh, prevailing winds or some other chemical things happening in the atmosphere between the pollutants. So, and the next thing, eutrophication. This is an enrichment of an ecosystem with a limiting nutrient. And uh, sources include nitrogen-containing gases like ammonia and NOx, and nitrogen-containing particulates of ammonium sulfate, ammonium nitrate. And um, so the acidification and eutrophication can all lead to um, kind of changes in vegetation, ecosystem function, and biodiversity loss. And with eutrophication, it's particular harmful for natural and semi-natural habitats that are usually nutrient limited. So the extra nitrogen from the pollutants can alter the competitive balance and um, lead to all the changes that you see. For example, uh, a switch from uh, wildflower witch meadow to rough grassland. And on the right, is a study we did um, along a transect downwind of a farm. So uh, looking at doing a lichen survey. And uh, so acidophytes, maybe I think all you, you guys here know, such as Cladonia, they prefer clean air with low ammonia and naturally weak conditions of the tree bark. And this is disappearing along the transect with increasing concentrations. So above 10 micrograms on the trunks is disappeared completely. Nitrophytes prefer high nitrogen supply and less acidic park. And uh, if we look at a the graph, then it's increasing with ammonia concentration as you go towards the farm. And um, the current understanding is that the effect of ammonia at high concentrations is that it's uh, neutralizing the pH on, tree, on the tree making it less hospitable for acidophytes. So critical loads. <laughs> so critical loads is um, 
a policy tool to assess the risk of um, input of acidity and nutrient input <coughs> to ecosystems. So anything exceeding that load indicates uh, increased risk of change to the ecosystem. And it's defined as a quantitative estimate of exposure to one or more pollutants below which significant harmful effects on sensitive elements of the environment do not occur, according to present knowledge. And um, in the UK, the critical load exceedance of acidity and nutrient nitrogen are reported every year. And you can find that on a DEFRA UK website. And um, for this map here is the critical load exceedance of acidity for acid sensitive habitats. So again, the situation in Scotland looks better than the rest of the UK, but there are still large areas that are in exceedance, so uh, affected by acid deposition. And on the right is a map for exceedance of nutrient N. Again, it looks better than the rest of the UK, but still large areas receiving nutrient input more than they should. So to summarize, <laughs> yeah, so um, the Industrial Revolution marked the start of the use of um, coal and other fossil fuels and left a legacy of air pollution <coughs> that we're still suffering from in the present time. And um, the Great Smog of London in 1952 led to a raft of legislations to control and reduce emissions from sulfur. So the legislations and policies have all been very successful in controlling sulfur pollution. But we now have a, a change in the chemical climate from a shift from sulfur pollution to nitrogen pollution because uh, NOx emission from transport is not coming down as quickly as we would like, and ammonia pollution from agriculture is still a huge problem. So nitrogen pollution today represents major threats to uh, human health, to the ecosystem, and also implicated in climate change. And um, yeah, I think that's what I'm going to say. Thank you. The next slide is questions and acknowledgement. <laughs> As you will hear later, I have a particular interest in NOx and mm -hmm. uh, NH3, and I will be giving an example of the uh, results of that. Yes. Do you think that as we see uh, transport being shifted towards electricity, mm -hmm. that we will see less NOx than you would expect major changes? Well, these things all take time, so... Um, but think about car ownership, which is increasing. So it depends on how quickly we can move to electrics, but we would expect to see um, improvement but then you still have to generate the electricity from power plants. So I guess this is where you have to target kind of mitigation. It's easier to mitigate at point source, so you can add scrubbers, than diffuse source like transport cars, moving cars. So we hope it will improve. So that is the projection, because at the moment we also got stricter emission standards like Euro 6 before we completely shift to electric cars. But it's going to be a problem with us for a few more years yet. And there's a ULES as well in Edinburgh. <laughs> um, looking at the news last night on the television, they were saying that one terrible pollutant that is escaping the radar is rubber from car tires. Yeah. And unlike plastics, it's in more, the, the, the particles are so small, mm -hmm. they're invisible in water. Yeah. But a huge portion of the mud sludges around our coast is of car tires. I like that. And you, you, you can't see it, except yeah. under a microscope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that, that is a huge problem and there's a lot of work on that mm -hmm. because it is recognised that wear and tear, road traffic from the tyres are contributing to a large amount of these particles in the air. And because it's very fine, you can breathe it into your lungs and cause problem. So there is a lot of work when they have um, specialist equipment that collects the air samples and they look at all the source attributions. So uh, they can get a signature on car tyres and they can find out how much of that actually comes from cars and from the different sources. But, um, but that, I think that is kind of an ongoing concern. The particles, yeah, the wear and tear from car tyres. I think, yeah, not sure how we can replace car tyres because rubber is such a good material. <laughs> right, time for one more question. Very nice talk, thank you. Nitrogen is, of course, a fertilizer for plants. So what we would expect to be happening is that the whole country should get greener, the walls should be greener, the fast-growing plants should grow even faster, uh, shading out the delicate, slow-growing species that don't benefit in the same way. So we should expect vegetational change. Uh, we should expect a decline in some rarities, which uh, will be outcompeted by the fast, tall-growing ones. Now, to what extent have we been able to see this in the record? I, I don't think we know the answer to that question. I think that is something one ought to be looking at. Yeah, I've got, um, I'm just going to, just, uh, <laughs> I've kind of reserved a slide because um, at the moment we have networks looking at air quality and we have networks looking at ecological change. But um, since 2018, we have formed this network called the uh, UK Air Pollution Impacts and Ecosystems Networks, and it's an attempt to integrate the air quality and ecosystem. So with the changes in policies and the changes in air emissions, concentration and deposition, are we seeing recovery in the plants? So this is bringing together all the different networks, long-term monitoring networks, and surveys like a countryside survey, so uh, to attempt to answer that question by using key bioindicators and uh, indicators. But the countryside survey, they've got funding to uh, do some more work now. <laughs> so uh, they should be able to uh, look at the changes. <laughs>